In the last video, we started to look at what happens when water flows through a pipe in the real world, and we discussed the effects of friction and viscosity. In this video, we're going to expand on this by thinking about the two main types of pipe flow. Laminar flow and turbulent flow. When fluid flows through a pipe slowly, we get something called laminar flow. Laminar flow has two main characteristics. Firstly, fluid particles in laminar flow flow in straight lines in the direction of the flow, which is normally parallel to the pipe's wall. So if we imagine a series of particles distributed across a laminar flow, these particles will stay in line with little or no movement across the pipe. Here particles will travel in smooth paths with almost all of the particles velocity in the primary direction of the flow. For laminar flow, there is almost no transfer of mass between the different layers of the flow. We can see an example of laminar flow by injecting dye into water flowing through a pipe slowly. Here we can see that the dye is staying in line with little or no transfer of mass across the pipe. The dye is not forming a perfectly straight line here because the injection system being used is not injecting the dye perfectly smoothly, but we can still see that once the dye is in the pipe, it doesn't change shape as it moves along the flow. The second characteristic of laminar flow is that we get a velocity profile with a gradual gradient. What we get in laminar flow is zero velocity at the wall, the maximum velocity at the pipe centre line, and then a gradually increasing velocity as we move away from the friction at the wall. And for laminar flow, this velocity profile can be described with a parabolic function. If we inject some dye across a pipe and establish a laminar flow, we can clearly see this parabolic velocity distribution, where fluid is stationary at the wall travelling at the flow's maximum velocity at the pipe's centre line, with the velocity continuously increasing as we go from the wall to the pipe's centre line. So our first main type of flow is laminar flow, characterised by fluid particles staying in line and a parabolic velocity profile, and laminar flow occurs when our fluid is flowing slowly. But as we increase the flow's velocity, there'll be some critical points where the flow becomes turbulent. In this example, dye is being injected into a turbulent flow, and we can now see the flow is behaving very differently. Turbulent flow is characterised by chaotic swirling eddies, and these eddies will transport fluid particles in all three dimensions across the pipe. giving particles velocity components in all three dimensions of the flow. So if we imagine a line of particles across a turbulent flow, because of the presence of these chaotic swirling eddies, particles will now not stay in line, but will be transported all over the pipe by these eddies. What this means is that particles are now not just experiencing the velocity at the location in the pipe where they started out, they're now continuously being moved all over the pipe, so we'll experience a whole range of velocities over a relatively short period of time. And what this does is flatten out the velocity profile, because the effect of particles continuously experiencing a large range of velocities across the pipe is to average out the velocity at any particular location in the pipe. So each individual particle will have a velocity that's close to the mean velocity. We still have zero velocity at the wall, the maximum velocity at the pipe centre line, and a gradient in between, but the velocity profile is now much more flat, with a much steeper gradient at the wall, and the majority of the particles across the flow 
traveling near the fluid's mean velocity. Turbulent velocity profiles can often be described by a logarithmic distribution, which predicts a relatively flat velocity profile. So, our flow can be laminar or turbulent, which are the two main distinctions we need to make when we're characterising a pipe flow. But the question is, can we explain exactly what is causing this phenomena? The honest answer to that question is no. Turbulent flow is one of the great unsolved problems in modern science. Despite decades of research and much unbelievable progress in our understanding, we are still a long, long way from having a complete understanding of the true underlying mechanisms of turbulence in flows. There's no mathematician or scientist in the world who can fully describe what's going on in this shot, which is why this is such an interesting subject to try to study. But at a very basic level, we can start to think of a few ideas that will help us to understand what is going on in these shots, certainly at a level that will be useful when studying bulk flow parameters for hydraulics. In a completely ideal world, flow would always be laminar, because there will be nothing causing particles to deviate from the path set by the primary direction of the flow. In a completely ideal world, particles would always flow in perfect streamlines. However, in the real world, there's almost always a disturbance that will be trying to make the particle deviate from this path. It may be tiny vibrations in the room where the pipe is sitting, or microscopic discontinuities in the pipe wall, but there'll always be some small force trying to make particles spin off their primary direction of travel. For laminar flow, the energy that the fluid particle has from its velocity is small compared to the viscous forces of the fluid. So the viscous forces of the fluid effectively dampen out these forces and allow the particle to stay in line. Imagine trying to stir a fluid with a high viscosity. It's really hard to cause long-term chaotic movement in this fluid because the viscous forces of the fluid will dampen out any disturbances caused by the stirring. And this is also true for a fluid with low viscosity if we only stir very slowly because now the kinetic energy from stirring the fluid is low compared to the fluid's viscosity. But if we stir the fluid very quickly we now can create chaotic movement because the kinetic energy from the stirring is large compared to the viscosity of the fluid. A similar thing is happening when we get turbulent flow. For turbulent flow, the inertial forces from the fluid's velocity are large compared to the viscous forces of the fluid, so we get chaotic movement because the viscous forces can no longer dampen out the inertial forces. So it seems that whether a flow is laminar or turbulent has something to do with the fluid's viscosity and the velocity. When the velocity is dominant, the flow will be turbulent. When viscosity is dominant, the flow will be laminar. But can we come up with a precise definition of when the flow will transition from being laminar to turbulent? We can get this from the flow's Reynolds number, a dimensionless number that tells us if the flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. Reynolds number is defined as the flow's mean velocity times by the pipe's diameter, divided by the flow's kinematic viscosity. This definition is actually giving us the ratio of the flow's inertial forces from its velocity to the viscous forces from its viscosity. The terms on the top of the equation quantify the inertial forces, and the terms on the bottom of the equation the viscous forces. If the viscous forces are dominant, the flow will be laminar. If the inertial forces are dominant, the flow will be turbulent. When Reynolds number is below 2000, the flow will be laminar, as viscous forces will be dominant. So 
So let's imagine we have a laminar pipe flow where Reynolds number is below 2000 and we have a disturbance in that flow. Let's say a pin at the flow's centre line. And let's imagine a particle making its way down this pipe. If Reynolds number is below 2000, when the particle hits the pin, it may start to deviate from its original path and may even try to spin, but the viscous forces will dampen out any disturbances and the particle will eventually continue to travel in a straight line. When Reynolds number is more than 4000, the flow will be turbulent as inertial forces are now dominant. Now let's consider the same example but with a Reynolds number of more than 4000. Now if a particle hits a pin, the particle will start to spin, but because the inertial forces are larger than the viscous forces, the viscous forces can now no longer dampen out the spinning so the particle spinning will propagate into full-scale turbulence that will eventually fill the whole pipe. And this is why we have a diameter in the Reynolds number. We call this the length scale, and the reason this is so important is because the diameter of the pipe will limit the scale of the turbulence, as our turbulent eddies cannot be any larger than the pipe's diameter. If Reynolds number is somewhere between 2000 and 4000, the flow is somewhere in between being laminar and turbulent, and we call this transitional flow. Here, there's a fight between the viscous forces and the inertial forces. So again, if we introduce a pin into the middle of the flow, and a particle hits this pin, we may get small-scale turbulence forming as the particle starts to spin under its inertial forces, but eventually this will probably be dampened out as the flow's viscous forces eventually take effect. So in transitional flow, we see small-scale turbulent structures, but they're normally local and only last for a short period of time before being damped out. Transitional flow is the hardest flow to analyse, as it's almost impossible to predict exactly what's going on. In all of these examples, we've been using a pin to show the effect of a disturbance in the flow. But as we touched on at the start, if there's no disturbance in the flow, the flow will remain laminar, independent of Reynolds number. What we're saying when we suggest the flow will be turbulent at a Reynolds number of more than 4000, is that this is the point at which we have sufficient inertial forces for the flow to become turbulent once we have a disturbance. In reality, we don't actually need to put a pin into the flow to make this work because there's always some disturbance in the real world. As we mentioned earlier, it may be tiny vibrations in the room where the pipe is sitting, or even just microscopic discontinuities in the pipe wall. But for real pipes, there's almost always imperfections that will trigger our turbulence around the point where Reynolds number is more than 4000. But it's also worth noting that these limits are generalisations. They work very well for the vast majority of systems, but to be exactly sure of the exact point of transition for a system in question, the point of transition will need to be measured. So now we've thought about the theory and discussed Reynolds number as a method to work out whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, let's have a go at doing a few examples. Let's say we have a pipe with a diameter of 24mm flowing at a discharge of 1 litre per second. Will this flow be laminar or turbulent? So we know Reynolds number is the flow's velocity times by the pipe's diameter divided by the fluid's kinematic viscosity. In this question we're given the pipe's diameter and we'll need to convert that from millimetres to metres. We're not given the velocity but we are given the discharge so we can convert the discharge into meters cubed per second and then use the continuity equation to get our velocity. Remembering that the area of a circular pipe is pi times the radius squared and the radius is half the pipe's diameter. The kinematic viscosity of water at room temperature is approximately 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. 
but a more accurate estimate of this value can very easily be looked up at a range of temperatures. So if we plug these numbers into the Reynolds number equation, we get a Reynolds number of 53051. So this flow will definitely be turbulent because the Reynolds number is way above 4000. Finally, let's have a go at doing this calculation the other way around. Let's say we are designing a system with the same pipe with a diameter of 24mm. But we want this system to run under laminar flow conditions. Can we work out the maximum discharge that the system can have to still give us laminar flow? So for the flow to be laminar, Reynolds number must be 2000 or below. So we can rearrange the equation to find out what velocity would give us a Reynolds number of 2000. And we can see the velocity would be 0.083 meters per second. So all we need to do to find the discharge is times this by the pipe's cross-sectional area. And this gives us the maximum discharge for the system that will give us laminar flow. Which is 0.0377 litres per second. So in this video we've looked at the two main types of flow. Laminar flow, where particles stay in line and the velocity profile is parabolic. And turbulent flow, where we have chaotic turbulence giving us velocity components in all three dimensions and a much flatter velocity profile. We've also looked at the Reynolds number as a method of working out if a flow will be laminar or turbulent. If Reynolds number is below 2000, the flow will be laminar. More than 4000, the flow will be turbulent. And in between 2000 and 4000, transitional. In the next video, we're going to combine what we did in the first part of this lesson, looking at viscosity and friction, with what we've looked at in this video, laminar and turbulent flow, and look at how all of these processes affect losses of energy in a real pipe.